Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Hope you've had a fantastic Monday, a fantastic Labor Day. And for the next little bit, just buckle up, make sure you're subscribed, because once again, I'm splitting $10,000 across 10 lucky subscribe beautiful bastards this month, and let's just jump into it. This is a new show. Everyone's getting banned off of social media platforms right now. That's what it feels like. But today you have a lot of people angry about someone getting unbanned. And that's largely because of this streamer. I believe her name is Kimika. I might be mispronouncing that. But she was recently banned off of Twitch because she actually had sex on stream. And there was a the question of, well, how long is she banned? Right, one constant criticism about Twitch is that they do not implement their bans equally. Which is why you had so many people furious when another massive creator who's actually banned off of Twitch, Jideon, interviewed this other streamer and she said that she was only banned for seven days. Which resulted in people in two camps. Some saying, okay, she's got to be lying. She's just doing this for clout. Seven days is going to pass. People are going to be like, oh, remember her? And she's going to try and convert it into something. But others are saying, no, that sounds like Twitch as usual and this is wrong. And during this time period, we saw more and more creators speaking out. People like Charlie, Moist Critical. Yet this girl orders a hot dog extra wiener on stream and only receives a seven day suspension. And then lo and behold, yesterday she got unbanned after just seven days, which a number of people pointed out was the same amount of time Hassan Piker got banned for saying the word cracker. And I think for a lot of people, this just further cements that Twitch is so incredibly inconsistent. And I think it's very easy to make the argument that Twitch has favorites when you have a former Twitch staples like Ludwig even speaking on this in the past, talking about instances where he should have gotten a three day ban, but then got a homie move from upper executives and he was fine. So I was meant to get banned for three days. However, it was kind of like uh, a homey move from a couple people at Twitch. They were like, hey, we went through, talked to some higher execs, give a squeaky cream, uh, clean profile. I think I was a favorite back then. Okay, people would say I was the golden boy of Twitch or whatever, and they didn't ban me. But I think I know full well a bunch of other creators who did the same thing probably would get banned. And that's not a bash on Ludwig. I think it's good that he's actually openly speaking about this. And while I will say, I think places like YouTube or really any place that has like an incomprehensible scale also have issues, but especially on Twitch, I don't know how you could feel safe from unequal crackdowns on your channel if you really look at their track record and dog shit communication. Like they just seem to do things haphazardly, but of course, I'd love to know your thoughts on the situation. Oh, and before we move on to the next story, I'm very excited to announce my new Twitch show, DeFranco's Dancing Dong. It's my one time a week show where I just, I helicopter my dick until Twitch uh, bans my channel for what, seven days? And then I'll come back and do it again because apparently seven days is the price of admission or do I actively have to put my dick in someone to get seven days? Otherwise it's maybe only three. To the Twitch execs, uh, my DMs are open. So feel free to provide any clarification whatsoever. So I want to dive deeper on this with you because, you know, last week we put out a video titled Stop Promoting Obesity, where we talked about the, the Abercrombie situation and the big online debate around uh, large people being accepted and included versus promoting unhealthy ideas and standards. For all the details or a refresher, I'll link to that video down below. We had an Abercrombie ad that featured a bunch of models with many people just focusing on the, the largest person. And a lot of people saw that as promoting obesity, whereas I and others just saw this as, you know, someone being included. Even noting that over 42% of Americans are obese, so this was a essentially a clothing company going like, hey, our clothes will fit you 42%. And something I always try and hit on with those stories is, you know, I've been every size, whether I'm big, I'm small, I'm whatever, and same for you. You're, you have value. You can love yourself while at the same time going, hey, I should probably make some healthier decisions. And your size shouldn't dictate whether it's okay or not to bully you. It's not okay. It's also, as we talked about, not fucking helpful. But also with that, I think it's important that we don't shy away from the very real health problem we have in this country. For example, you recently had NPR reporting, diet-related deaths outrank deaths from smoking and about half of US deaths from heart disease, nearly 900 deaths a day, are linked to poor diet. And noting the pandemic highlighted the problem with much worse outcomes for people with obesity and other diet related diseases, with a cardiologist even describing it as the U.S. being in a nutrition crisis, especially as we continue to see studies finding that ultra-processed foods are linked to cancer and early death. Things like pre-packaged soups, sauces, frozen pizza, ready-to-eat meals, hot dogs, sausages, french fries, sodas, store-bought cookies, cakes, candies, donuts, ice cream, and more. With a number of people arguing it's also hard because a lot of those foods are also some of the most affordable. Because in this country, we also have a food insecurity problem. And as NPR notes there, the U.S. can't fix hunger by just feeding people cheap, high-calorie processed foods, which is the food that's so abundant in our food supply, which is why we're seeing a new report putting out recommendations. The first being treat food as medicine, noting that there's mounting evidence that providing prescriptions for fruit and vegetables can spur people to eat better and manage weight and blood sugar, with there also being an idea for healthcare systems or insurers to provide or pay for healthy groceries, and combining that with nutrition education. And there, it turns out there are actually some pilot programs that let Medicaid or Medicare pay for the meals in several states. Two, focus on quality of calories, not just quantity, noting that when you're on a tight budget or you're relying on things like food stamps, processed foods like chips and soda can set you back less than fresh produce. 
We've actually seen attempts to tackle this. Like in select communities, if you get food stamps, you get more money to buy fruit and vegetables. There have also been things like a double bucks program, which doubles the value of food stamp benefits when used to buy produce at farmers markets and other venues. But those are small programs and not something we're seeing at a nationwide scale. And among the other seven, which I'll link to down below, one of them is having a federal food czar. With the recommendation noting, the US government spends more than $150 billion each year on food and nutrition related programs. And the healthcare system also spends billions of dollars on treatment of diet related diseases. But the task force pointing to, this spending is fragmented across 200 separate actions in 21 different departments and agencies without harmonization or synergy. The idea being that if it's not streamlined, there's not this grand plan where everything's working in harmony, there's just gonna be a lot of waste. And we got to say, hey, we tried, we threw money at the problem without actually implementing meaningful change. And it's gonna be interesting to see what changes do we potentially see with a country continuing to get more and more obese? And also how effective will those changes be? Because yes, there are systemic issues in our society that make it harder to, to, to not be obese. But I'm also aware as me having had pretty much every resource I would need to live a healthy lifestyle at my fingertips, it still took so much more and it was just a very personal journey. And so I do think trying to change the system and, and making it more accessible for people to live healthier lifestyles, that's gonna be helpful, but it's not gonna be like the thing that solves it all. But I guess why this has been in my head is I wanna say, I think there are two separate issues. I do genuinely think that we have a health crisis in this country, but that does not make villainizing or bullying people who are obese or severely obese okay. And showcasing that larger people can fit in your clothes is not like promoting obesity. And in that space, one of the only areas where I do get pissed off are people that, that kind of promote this idea of equal health at every weight. I saw a TikTok the other day that said a doctor was being fat phobic because they told their obese patient that they should maybe, you know, lower their calorie intake. And of the calories they were getting in, they should also try to get more of them from fruits and veggies. Well, everyone can have different health issues. And I know people like talk about thyroid issues and stuff like that. As far as everyone, as far as that being a general statement, that's not, that's not fat phobic, that's science. It's literally part of a doctor's job. You can't compare your general practitioner or dietitian to some guy on Reddit or Twitter calling you fat or attacking you for existing. When I was at my biggest and my doctor prescribed me blood pressure medication and recommended a healthier diet, I wasn't like, how dare you call me fat and insinuate my health problems are connected to me being obese. I don't know, there's just like a lot of ridiculousness and a lot of hate and it's just, uh, it's, it's so much. <laughs> You're gonna wanna keep your eyes on the UK because things are probably about to get interesting. Liz Truss just won the Conservative Party leadership election, which means she is going to be the UK's next prime minister, beating her main opponent 57 to 43%. As far as why this is gonna be interesting to watch, as Axios explains, most recently as foreign secretary, Truss took a hawkish approach to relations with the EU and the war in Ukraine. And that's in addition to more local things like vowing to slash taxes despite the rocky state of the UK's finances. And reportedly saying that within a week, she will come up with a plan to tackle rising energy bills and securing future fuel supplies, which is an incredibly important thing to note because Russia has now suspended gas flows to Europe and saying that it will not resume until sanctions are lifted on it. And so this will raise energy prices in Europe even higher than they already are and will likely raise gas prices in the States. With this, Russia's decision to shut off the gas came after the G7 said it would impose a price cap on Russia's oil exports. And so this is being seen as Russia's most brazen attempt to break Western unity, but many experts believe it's unlikely to work. With previous polls having continually shown that Americans are willing to pay more at the pumps to keep Russia sanctioned and European countries have been preparing for the scenario since March. And just politically speaking, if the West shows that it can be black it won't just be Ukraine that's endangered, it'll be all of Europe. <laughs> Y'all, fantasy football season is finally here and my nerdy ass is excited. And to make it even more awesome, I brought in today's fantastic sponsor, FanDuel. Single game contests are a great way to get in on the action for the week's biggest matchups with huge cash prizes up for grabs. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars in prizes all football season long in FanDuel fantasy contests. And if you're new to fantasy or just new to FanDuel, there's no better time. And that's for a few reasons. First, new customers get a free single game entry when you sign up for FanDuel. For that one, you just draft your five player lineup, you put your best player in the MVP position where fantasy points are multiplied by one and a half. Plus on FanDuel, you can also play full slate contests featuring multiple games, season long, best ball contests, and so much more. And when you win, you'll get paid fast. So what are you waiting for? Kick off football season with a free single game entry when you download the FanDuel Fantasy app and sign up with promo code DeFranco. That's promo code DeFranco to get your free single game entry. Also, separate from that, if you wanna go head to head with me, on my own, I made a 100 person $10 entry contest I'm gonna be playing. Just make sure you get in before Thursday because I'm gonna be doing something around the first game of the season, as well as after Thursday night, setting it up for Sunday. Same link, same setup. Up, make sure you use promo code DeFranco and happy football season. 
The future of this country is at stake in these upcoming midterms and unfortunately in pretty much every election for the very near future. Well, understandably, going into these midterms, many people are just focused on the House and the Senate. There's much more at play here. And that's especially true for swing states with races that are expected to ultimately determine the control of Congress as well as what the fucking country looks like moving forward. Right, we're talking about states that are some of the last holdouts with abortion protection, states that Trump and his allies fought to try to overturn the election and where Republican candidates are campaigning on his lies about voter fraud. And if those folks win their races, even the ones that are just about their state, it could have serious consequences nationwide. Or they could cut off access to abortion, not only for the residents of their state, but further limit options for those who live in neighboring states with restrictions and need to travel to get the procedures. They could also, and this is what we've been talking about for the last two years, seriously meddle with the election systems. Or at the very least, have people who are willing to throw out the popular vote and the will of the people in a situation like 2020, where Trump tried to get officials in swing states to do just that. One of those key states, of course, is Nevada. Nevada specifically is one of the places where Trump most intensely contested the results. And so it's not surprising that it's one of the states that has the higher relative percentage of far right and extremist candidates. And some of those candidates are running for key offices that you might not think about, like the office of the attorney general, who notably is one of the main people fighting against all the attempts to destroy democracy in the state. Right in that race, the current attorney general, Aaron Ford, is facing right wing lawyer Sigal Chatta, who notably strongly beat a more moderate Republican in the primaries and as many extremist views. And that's just the public stuff. That's not even including her leaked text messages where she said that the AG should be lynched. But, you know, to try to get a better lay of the land and learn more about what is at stake for the voters in Nevada and beyond, we reached out to AG Ford to talk about everything. So AG Ford, uh, I, I just have to jump into it. There's a lot I want to talk about, but I guess my first question is just, what do you what do you think it says about the, the state of politics that Seagal Chatta is the Republican nominee for your job right now? Well, I think it says a couple of things, because in addition to her being the nominee, um, we have seen a part of the party the reasonable part of the party uh, that has endorsed me over their own candidate, right? So it's clear that there's a schism within the Republican Party, uh, and that schism has produced, on the one hand, an extreme uh, MAGA Republican and Sagala Chatha, um, who, you know, is does not have the best interests of Nevadans uh, in in mind and would be uh, not a good fit for the Attorney General's office. And on the other side of the schism are those who. Um, you know, to be sure, maybe ideologically um, different on, on approaches that we take as Democrats, but are certainly more moderate and more reasonable uh, in, in their approach. And, and uh, those individuals, we, we've been able to roll out a Republicans for Forward um, committee. They, they have, um, to their credit, um, you know, supported the, the, the better candidate in this race. So on the note of not having the best interests in mind, what do you what do you mean there uh, if we're you know com comparing and contrasting you and her? Well, there are a number of things that I can offer in response. I'll start with um, uh, one of the most prevalent uh, headlines right now, which is the Supreme Court undermining a woman's right to choose and getting rid of a constitutional right for the first time in the history of our country, one of this super 50 years. Uh, and with Seagal having been quoted as, or, or noted as having said that she essentially wants to prosecute and imprison women who seek abortions. And that's notwithstanding the fact that in our state, we have abortion rights and statutorily uh, codified and protected. And so how she would go about doing that, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to her imagination. But the point is, um, she's adverse to that particular right. You know, and, and you know, frankly, in my from my perspective, this job requires someone who is going to respect the humanity and dignity of everyone who lives in this state. And it's clear to me that she does not respect the humanity and dignity of people in this state, including me. Um, she is quoted as having said she wants to see me hanging from an effing crane. And so, you know, th those are two examples of um, why I know she would not have the best interests of Nevadans uh, at heart. Uh, and uh, we have to reject her. Also, for anyone watching, that is a that is a legitimate quote. That's from a, a leaked tech me text message, right? And she tried to defend it by saying it was. It, I don't understand how you defend that <laughs> statement. Yeah, well, there's no defense to it. She's not apologized. Not that it would matter, frankly. Uh, but uh, you're right. That, that's a leaked text that she sent to someone um, you know, at some point last year, I believe it was. That's and the, she did defend it by saying she's Israeli American, and that's part of her cultural uh, dialogue, so to speak. And she says that essentially she was essentially com comparing me to the leader of Hamas and that uh, as uh, terrorists talk, that's how terrorists deal with traitors. So again, you know, her, her explanation is nonsensical um, and, and certainly uh, one that doesn't speak to um, the fact that here in this country, um, when you talk about hanging a black man, that's that, you know, that's that, that's that's lynching. And at the end of the day, um, there's no place for that in Nevada politics, in politics anywhere. Uh, and, and I'm hoping and I'm grateful to see, again, some Republicans uh, come out opposed to her um, for, for, for that reason alone. Um, but 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 certainly we have to, as a state, um, reject that and, and reelect me as attorney general. 
So I, I believe you've used that that text message because it is it's disgusting. Some would argue that it's disqualify disqualifying as a, a reason that you won't engage in a debate. So I, I guess kind of uh, what do you say to push back uh, of pe from people saying, yes, it is disgusting, but it shouldn't take away uh, Nevadans right to see their AG uh, talk about the last four years and what he would like to do moving forward. Well, there are a couple of responses. The first of which is that they can absolutely hear me talk about what I've done the last four years and what I intend to do the next four years, because I am an open book in that regard. I'm having interviews like this, for example, with you, uh, which which is open to the public. Um, I, I speak frequently and periodically on what it is that we do in our office, what we intend to continue doing. And there will be no dearth of uh, opportunity for the public to hear about Aaron Ford and what I stand for. But what I will also say is that I do not feel compelled for one second to stand in the same room with a person who wants to see me hanging from a freaking crane. And I say freaking, but that's not what she said. Uh, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, th those those words are hurtful words. Uh, and it, again, demonstrates she has no respect for my humanity or my dignity. Uh, and I will I will communicate with the public in a different way. And then I think moving forward, what would you be concerned with if Republicans do win in this upcoming election? What do you where do you think that there are the, the biggest concerns. Obviously, you already talked about uh, abortion rights and, and concerns there. Uh, you're going against someone that ha has said that uh, they believe that there was election fraud. Uh, what do you think is the worst case scenario? What happens if you don't get reelected? Well, we don't have to guess. We don't have to surmise. Uh, we can look at what's already happening. Uh, look, uh, I, I don't know if people call me progressive or, or not, but here's what I know that the opposite of progressive is regressive. <laughs> and I'd much rather be progressive than regressive. And I am absolutely concerned about regressing with a Republican um, uh, in the attorney general's office. We, we can see what happens. We've regressed 50 years in, in the context of abortion rights. We've regressed to before the times of civil rights with attacks on voting rights. Uh, we've regressed relative to recognizing the humanity of our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters by not being able to say gay in Florida, for example, right? And so these are examples of things that Republicans are doing and will continue to do uh, if we don't stand up and push back and, and refuse uh, um, a regressive approach uh, to to the way that we coexist with one another. And could you also explain what a, an attorney general can do to to counter election deniers and and what you can do to safeguard the institutions that we're supposed to protect? Uh, well, absolutely, and you don't have to. You, I don't have to, you know, guess or surmise because I've lived it. Uh, two years ago, there was uh, there was an attack on the basic integrity of our election system. Look, I took an oath of office four years ago that said I would protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Nevada. Didn't really realize that that meant that I would literally be uh, defending the existence of our democratic republic with people trying to undermine the, the, the actual existence of our republic by claiming uh, and lying about widespread voter fraud. And attorneys general can push back on that by doing what I did, and that's defeating lawsuits that are waged to undermine the, the, the electoral process. There was at a minimum of six that were directed toward the state that my office had to defend, and we prevailed on them. To be sure, when the off occurrences of voter fraud do occur, and every once in a while they do, I prosecute them. Uh, and, and proof positive of the fact is that there was this one individual who was claimed to be the poster child, essentially, of the problems with widespread voter fraud in Nevada. He was over news stations like Fox, for example, given the story about his deceased wife, God bless her soul, whose ballot that was mailed to her had been voted. And he swore up and down. He didn't know what happened. But, you know, he claimed that someone voted his dead wife's ballot. And that was the proof positive fact that there was voter fraud going on. And, you know, shame on whoever, you know, voted her, her, her ballot. Well, we investigated that and found out that he voted his dead wife's ballot. Uh, and I prosecuted him. I charged him for that and took a guilty felony plea from him. Uh, and so in the one off instances where they occur, my office prosecutes those. But what, what we are not abide is is people lying about widespread voter fraud. And attorneys general can be those who are protecting the of the front line as a front line defense and the last line defense, protecting our de democratic institutions and our processes. So H.G. E. Ford, I would say, what is uh, your message to voters in regards to why it's impo important to, to vote for Democrats this fall, especially in a state like Nevada, where it, it's a massively important battleground state, not only for uh, the House of Representatives, not only for for uh, the Senate, but for your job specifically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an it's an easy statement to make, uh, and but it's a sale that we have to undertake. Um, we know what's going to happen if Republicans take over. Look, in 2014, 
Uh, let me back up. In 2012, I was first elected to the Nevada State Senate, elected into a, a majority uh, in the Senate Democrats uh, as a Senate Democrat. And two years later, we lost that majority. We were in the minority. I was elected minority leader by my caucus. What we saw them try to do relative to rolling back uh, voting rights, getting rid of early voting or getting rid of Sunday voting, which is a direct attack on on souls to the polls and the black voters, uh, you know, uh, and, and doing other things of that sort. We saw what happened. Now, we were able to push back and we were able to stop some of that. But we got there because of not a red wave, which is what they try to attribute it to and what they say is happening, could potentially happen this year. But because of what I called a blue boycott, it wasn't so much that the Republicans swept. It was that Democrats boycotted and stayed home. They didn't show up. And because they didn't show up, we almost lost so much in 2014. We cannot have that repeat. And that's that's not even a whole decade away uh, uh, um, you know, in the past. So my my. Um, comment to Nevadans is that it's important for us to remember um, the difficulties that we had to uh, address and face in 2014 and what's ahead of us uh, and stand up and protect our rights and continue putting people into office who respect us from a humanity and a dignity perspective, but also from a, from a, a, a constitutional rights perspective. And A.G. Ford, are, are there any other issues that you want to highlight for voters or, or anything else you want to tell them? Usually I, I, you know, I like to ask the person I'm talking to, like, what's a question that you, you wish you had been uh, set up for? Uh, that you could speak on that you think is important to voters? Well, I think we've covered quite a bit of what I think is important. And again, it's to focus on justice. Uh, it's to focus on justice for all, um, recognizing that it doesn't always, for example, manifest itself in the criminal justice context in an arrest and a conviction. Sometimes it manifests itself uh, in an exoneration and compensation. Uh, and that is that too is justice because systems are made of people. The criminal justice system is made of people and people are fallible. Uh, and so justice requires us to recognize that fallibility and redress injustices by pursuing justice. Uh, and that's the criminal context, but it's also in the civil context. And it's also in the context of our everyday interactions. And it's important, again, to have people in, the, in this office, the top law enforcement officer position in this state, to understand the importance of justice and to not shy away from pursuing it uh, under any circumstance. Uh, and so I, I'm proud of the work we've been able to do uh, in, in those areas that I've talked about today. Uh, and, and I think those efforts speak for themselves. And, and I would hope that that's a sufficient um, a reason for uh, Nevadans to continue to support me and to return me to office in November. A.G. Ford, thank you for the time. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. So that was Nevada's Attorney General Aaron Ford. And uh, going into the midterms, this is going to be something that I'm going to be trying to do, interviewing more incumbents and candidates as we get closer and closer to the midterms, because there's a lot of races that matter, and some not even at the top of a lot of people's minds. And in a number of these potential nation-changing races, like it's going to be decided by a fraction of a point. But with all that, I just want to say thank you once again for watching and being subscribed to my daily dives in the news. This is the end of today's show, and so I'll say my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love Love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.